All right. Morning, everybody. Uh, the next talk is about some ongoing research that we have, a project going on up in the Sangres here locally. And Tyler Cherney and Jose Mix are going to be talking about um, some preliminary data that we have. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you. So like Dr. Armstrong said, my name is Tyler Cherney. And I'm Jose Mix. And today we're going to be talking about lions, bats, and bears. Oh my. To begin this presentation, we'd like to give a quick introduction of what we're going to be, or overview of what we're going to be talking about. We'll go into an introduction, talk about the mining history in Colorado, a little bit about the dangers associated with these mines, and then we'll go into what our study entailed and what we wanted to look for. We'll then go into the methods of our study and how we studied these animals at these mines. We'll go into our results, and we'll finish up with a quick conclusion and really talk about the future of our study. Mining in Colorado began about the mid-1800s when an expedition led by the Russell brothers led to the discovery of gold near Denver. Now, the discovery of gold really began what was known as the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, and with this gold rush brought many settlers and miners to the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are home of many minerals including gold, silver, copper, and molybdenum. A little closer to home, the silver boom in Creed about 10 years after the Pikes Peak Gold Rush really brought more settlers and miners to the San Luis Valley. It was said that the population of Creed increased from about 600 to about 10,000. So you can imagine the population of Alamosa in Creed. It's quite a difference in people, quite a difference on the landscape and mining going on. However, for this study, Creed was not the main focus. The Sangre de Cristo Mountains east and northeast of Alamosa was. Mining in the Sangres began about the early 1900s and extended until the mid-1900s or even a little bit later when most mining or traditional mining halted. With the mining legacy in Colorado comes many human dangers. This is because there's 23,000 inactive and abandoned mines in Colorado. And so some of these dangers associated with these inactive and abandoned mines include falling into an abandoned mine shaft, having a mine shaft collapse on top of you, poisonous gases, and drowning. Now, the two most common that typically cause injury or death to humans are falling into an abandoned mine shaft or having the mine shaft collapse on top of you. So here's a photo that can be perceived as just two large boulders. However, this is a collapsed mine shaft that we found during our research. So you can imagine if you or somebody that you were with was in this mine shaft, there would be really no way to get out, which would probably result in death or extreme injury. So we kind of talked about the human dangers. These mines also have a lot of environmental concerns. So some of the environmental concerns that these mines have is something called acid mine drainage. And so what acid mine drainage is, it's the over acidification of water that comes out of these mines and leaches into the streams of the surrounding area. And so this acid mine drainage is usually through the occurrence of sulfur containing rocks that interact with oxygen and water and produce this over acidification of the water that flows out. As you can see in this, mine, in this picture here, that over acidification turned this river yellow. And this is an example of the Gold King mine blowout that occurred in 2015 in Silverton, Colorado, where it dumped about 3 million gallons of water into the Animas River, turning it this yellow color. Now, when we think about a biological standpoint, standpoint to wanting to gate these mines off, we think about white nose syndrome and it's caused by a fungus called Pseudogymnicus destructicans. And what it does is it invests, ingests, and digests the skin of these bats, primarily on the nose tips and on the wing brain membranes, and that's why it's called white nose syndrome. And so what this does is it, as it digests the skin of these bats, it causes an irritation to them, and it causes them to wake up during hibernation. So as we all know, during the winter months, there aren't very many insects, which is good for us, but for these guys, it's not very good at all because that's their main food source. So they essentially starve to death as they use these, those fat reserves that they save for winter hibernation to use during that short period of time when they wake up. And what it's done is it's a very harmful disease that's killed about 6.7 million bats since its first discovery in 2006 in New England. And as you can see, this is the distribution of this syndrome across the US. It first started in New England there and it's spread westward ever since. There's a population that jumped to Washington, and then there's this population in northern Texas. Since it's so close to Colorado, there's been a push to gate these mines off, so that way 
humans and larger animals don't track their, the spores on their feet or paws and transfer them from mind to mind. So like Jose referred to, white-nose syndrome is a fungus and so it is traveling through spores. And you can think of spores and fungus as seeds and plants. This is how there's means of dispersal. And so yes, it can travel on human shoes as well as the paws and fur of animals. And so what resource agencies have determined to do is close the mines using bat gates. Now what a bat gate is, is you can see the mine shaft here. And basically these agencies will come in and will put metal bars across the, the adit or the opening of the mine. And what this does is it allows bats to go in and out without any issues. However, it does not let humans nor large animals such as this mountain lion go into the mine. Now this is really to minimize the spread of these spores, decreasing the prevalence and the abundance of the disease within the population of the bats. There is observations that large animals such as mountain lions and bears are using the mines. However, it is unknown spatially and temporally the use of these mines. And so gating the mines or sealing the mines to prevent acid mine drainage may have adverse effects to the population of these animals if they're using them. So what we're going to look at in this study is a little bit as, are these animals using these mines? And as we can see in the past two pictures, there is evidence that they are. So we're going to further understand what they're using them for and what different species are using these mines. Are they just large carnivores like those two pictured before? Or are they smaller ones? Are they birds? Reptiles? And then we're going to look at, does this, are they, how are they using them? So are they using them for food? Are they using them for denning sites? Are they using them in the winter for hibernation? And then additionally, we'll see how does this vary through the seasons? So in the winter months, are there more prevalence with bears using them for hibernation? And in the spring, are bobcats and mountain lions using them more often to have their cubs in? Then we'll see how the physical aspects of these mines have any influence on their usage. So does the size affect it? Does the portal type, the aspect of the mine, and the elevation? And then throughout the study, we will look at all species, but we'll primarily focus on carnivores. And now I'll go into a little bit about the methods on how we went about observing these observations. So our study area was the western slopes of the San Gabriel Cristo Mountains, as seen here. This image shows, or these yellow pins indicate where our mines are, and we have about 30 mines out at the moment. And so what we did is these green boxes here indicate the raw data that we originally obtained, and what these were, they were mines grouped into three or five. And so what we did is we found the direct GPS coordinate of each one, we numbered them, and then we, gave, we found a number generator to determine which mine we would go to first. So what we did out in the field is we went to the first mine. If it was just a prospect or just a hole in the ground, we went on to the second one until it was an actual mine. And so what we did is we did this until we found two to three mines that we placed cameras at to be able to find this distribution, this distribution in the northern sand grays, and this in the southern. As you can see, the sand dunes separates the two. They're at the top and here at the bottom. So, as you look at these two pictures, you can see some major differences. In the northern sand grays, it's a very even spread of mines, but in the southern sand grays, there's a hole of mines right here. And so what this is, is this is private land. We didn't have access to this private land, and neither did this <coughs> original data set. So what we hope to do is further, in the future, be able to gain a connection with these private landowners to be able to place mines in these areas, place cameras in these areas here. And as you can see, this is an even distribution, so it can be assumed that in the southern San Grace, there will be another even distribution of mines. So let's go into how we monitor these mines. We used tra camera traps, or also known as trail cameras. And these cameras allow us to gain a lot of data without actually having to be present. They're great because they're very non-invasive. They don't leave a very big ecosystem footprint. And so how these work is there is an infrared beam or laser that is emitted out of the camera. And if you guys can imagine that my laser pointer is the camera, and as something walks by and breaks the laser beam as my hand is, it sends a signal to the camera to take a picture. For this study, and specifically, we used Cabela's Trailmaster 14 megapixel cameras, and that was just because of the cost efficiency and the good reviews that we found on it. It sh seemed like it would be a good fit for our, our study. We then placed them into lock boxes labeled with ASU Research. This was really to prevent theft, vandalism, and to show the community that it's out on the landscape, you know, 
we are out there. We are doing research as undergrads. We're trying to re earn respect, you know, from, from our community. We then place them on trees nearby the mines, posts nearby the mines, or on T-posts that we brought in ourselves. Camera checks were fairly simple. We went back to the mines that we placed the cameras on and obtained the memory cards out of them. We then replaced them with blank memory cards as well as checked the batteries for sufficient charge to make sure that they were going to last until we could get up there again. We then returned to the school to download our photos onto the computer, which began our analysis. Now, how the analysis worked is very tedious work, and I say that because we had thousands and thousands of pictures to sift through. So a lot of it was going back and forth the pictures, as I am right now, looking for differences such as this bobcat here. Now, if you could see that this was fairly easy to pick out because it is a large animal and it sticks out. However, like I said, we had thousands and thousands of pictures. A lot of them were from the sun changing and shadows, the wind blowing trees and things of that nature. And so a lot of it was flipping back and forth, looking for differences. So I want to ask you all a question. How many of you noticed this chipmunk that set off the camera here at the bottom, the very first picture I showed? So I kind of just wanted to show you guys, it was very tedious work, it was a lot of it. it, was just sitting there on the computer, flipping back and forth, looking for differences. So after we analyzed it, we were able to come up with some results. So as mentioned before, we only have preliminary results as this study is still ongoing. But what we found is we had 30,912 capture hours. This was about a sorry, uh, six month span from June to January, and we had about 50,000 pictures. Some cameras containing up to 10,000 pictures, some had five. And we caught animals of all different species. We caught carnivores, rodents, ungulates, lagomorphs, birds, and even reptiles. And so now I'll go into a little bit about the different animals that we found. So here we have the carnivores. We found bear, weasel, mountain lion, bobcat, and even foxes at these mines. When we look at the smaller side, we see rodents. We found su some such as this deer mouse and this pine squirrel here. And what, this ro what the rodents help indicate is that there is in fact food for these smaller carnivores to be visiting these mines. And so therefore, there is a reason for them to be there. Again, on the larger side, we found mule deer and elk. And again, this drives in the same fact that there is food for these larger carnivores, such as bear and mountain lion, and therefore it is reasonable for them to be at these mines. We even caught some rabbits here, like this little cottontail rabbit here going in and out of this mine. This one specifically had about 9,000 pictures of him just going in and out, in and out, back and forth. So, and in one of our further pictures, you, we see a bobcat at this mine. Again, indicating that this is a prey source for those smaller carnivores. We even caught some birds, such as this house right here and this cellar's jade. This one specifically, this species of birds anyways, was found at almost every one of our mines except for one. So that's something interesting to understand. And we even saw reptiles, such as this little northern fence lizard here and right here in the middle of the picture. So that was just surprising to see that even reptiles are using these mines as a home. So since this study primarily focused on carnivore use, we wanted a way to illustrate our data that we could really show the extent of the use and, and things of that nature. So on this figure here, on the x-axis, we have the date. And I want to point out the beginning of the lines denote the date that we put the cameras out, and the end of the lines denote the date that we checked the cameras. As you can see, we had a large variety of carnivore use, kind of as Jose alluded to, and the asterisks on all of these animals here illustrate that they were either using the mine at some point, they were in it for some, some time, or they were passing through the mine. These other ones without the asterisks just show that they were in the area, either checking out the mine or just passing by. For this, I really want to focus on one specific mine, though. This mine three at 9,410 feet. This mine could be hypothesized that it was being used as a territorial spot for mountain lions. And some evidence to support that is here's a photo of a mountain lion, which can be seen as scenting. Now, big cats, or I guess all cats in the wild, and even at your house cats, will use scenting to mark territory. And so what they do is they have a scent gland on their face, and they will rub it to spread their scent to mark their territory. A little more evidence for this is that this photo was taken on September 11th at about 9.11 a.m. 10 minutes later, or 20 minutes later, there was a bear that visited the same spot to check out, you know, what's going on there. Why, you know, checking out the territory of this mountain lion. 
We also hypothesize that this mine be, be, may be using as a breeding site for mountain lions. And the reason is, is mountain lions are typically solitary animals. Solitary means that they occur typically by themselves, unless it's during the breeding season, or a mother mountain lion is raising their young. And so this photo here, you can see presumably a male is chasing presumably a female out of the mine. However, this could also support the hypothesis that is, is this is territorial because typically mountain lion habitat or territories will overlap just a little bit. And so this mountain lion may just be chasing this one out of its territory. And a little more evidence that they are using the mines and maybe another hypothesis is that this lion may be checking this area out for a denning site or maybe just using it overnight or for hunting or things of that nature. I kind of mentioned it earlier in when I was talking about trail cameras that they allow us as researchers to gather a lot of data, specifically not being there. And so they allow us to capture things that you wouldn't normally be able to capture being present, such as rare and elusive species. Now, this is a ringtail cat, which is kind of funny because it's more related to the raccoons than it is the cats. And so it's pretty interesting that they named it that. For those who do not know, these typically occur at lower elevations in the desert. And so there's a lot of people, especially in the San Luis Valley, that don't even know these things exist, let alone here. So to see it at one of our mines and using one of our mines is very groundbreaking for us. It's, it's amazing to be able to see that we have results of these rare and elusive species that you normally wouldn't see, and they are using these mines. Now we'll go into the conclusion and have and really talk about the future of the study. So we conclude that yes, wildlife are using these mines, such as bobcats, we talked about rodents and ungulates and lagomorphs, how they are prey sources for these carnivores, and that they may be the reason for their visits to these mines. We then talked about things such as birds and reptiles, things you normally wouldn't th think of at mines that are using these. And then we went, or, er, and the extent of the use is still unknown, however. And we hope to be able to figure that out over the next few years of this study. We also expect that the use will increase during the winter months, and that's just because of denning behavior and hibernation behavior of these carnivores. So now we'll go into a little bit about the future of this project. And so what we hope to do is we hope to further analyze the 20 remaining cameras that we have out, as well as further analyze the 10 cameras that were used for this project, as they're still collecting data for us. We also hope to be able to find a correlation between the hibernacle behavior of bears the denning behavior of both bobcats and mountain lions during the spring when they're having their cubs, and to determine if there's a correlation between the usage and if animals are looking for prey or food. Additionally, what this project, the long-term goals of this project are for these first two years is to determine the usage of these mines, which through our preliminary data is evident that they are using them. During the second two years, we hope to be able to take this observations De develop hypotheses and then test those and see how or determine the extent of the usage of these mines. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to commute to correlate the rich mining history of Colorado with the behavior and habitat of these animals. With that we'd like to thank our advisor Dr. Armstrong for all of his guidance and helping us place these cameras and things of that nature. We'd like to thank students Erica and Wyatt for helping with the camera placement. We'd like to thank Adam State University and the Porter Scholar Fund for providing funding and the facilities to conduct our research, as well as all of these land management agencies which allowed us access to the forest and gave us permission to place these cameras. Here are our references, and with that, we'd be glad to take any questions. This may not be related, but it might be somewhat related. Um, the current uh, happenings with the sand dunes area, with the potential for mining over there, is that um, in the similar area to where some mines already exist from where, because I was looking at your map there, mm -hmm. is that, do you know anything about that? Is that a similar area where they're proposing to do that? Uh, do you know anything about that? And if not, Irrelevant. That, that's a great question. Can I restate your question? Are you are you talking about the oil drilling? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so right uh, as of right now, no, that is not in our study area. I believe 
as the crow flies, it's very close to the sand dunes, but it's on the other side of the San Ridge Crystal Mountains. Oh, so it's on the eastern side? Actually. I believe so. Okay. And so for so for our study, like it wouldn't affect it as of right now. But I was just curious. No, that, no that's a great question. Recently, yeah. Didn't know if it was in a similar area or what. Yeah, thank you.